Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to this webinar with a spotlight on closing the loop for difficult to recycle plastics, looking in particular at a quality recycling process. This project has been developed by CFLEX team and stakeholders, as well as expert advisors and academic partners. And we're happy you're here this morning to discover more. We are actually around 300 uh, in the room. So uh, principally from Europe, but also from North America, Asia and Latin America. So thank you very much for the interest. And today we hope to discover some key insights about the process and its outputs. Uh, we'll learn about the financial analysis and business models. And as well as that, we'll be able to try and detect some future business opportunities in markets and opportunities to collaborate as well in the next steps. Our speakers today are Dana Masora from CFLEX, uh, Kim Ragat from Maastricht University, and Stephen de Master Meester from Ghent University. And I'm pleased to say that these insights are being complemented by uh, real world experiences and takeaways from those people who are putting this into practice on the ground. So we have four members of the action team joining us today as well. So it's two minutes past 11 and I will ask Dana to join me and give us a few words about the what and the why. And if you have any questions, as we go along, please use the question and answer box and we'll try and address those at the end. So Dana, over to you. I'm so happy to finally have this opportunity to ch share the quality recycling process as being one of the solutions which CFLEC has developed for the end of life of the household collected flexible plastic waste as a new approach to emerging market demands. What this is about, you will learn in the following presentation slides, which will give you the insight both on the market opportunity as well as the technical concept and the business case. So if I am to start, I would like to start by highlighting the project goals which we as CFLEX has established back in 2017 when we started. What we wanted is to come with a solution which will increase plastic recycling rates at that time, looking really at the impact of the new measurement point, but moreover, making flexible packaging circular. We had chosen three questions to answer through this project in which aims to develop a solution. And the questions were about, can we increase the part of flexible packaging waste household collected, which can be returned to economy at the highest value possible, which means to replace virgin plastic? How can we increase the value of recycled polymers from household post-consumer recycled uh, packaging? And which would be the technical limits and the cost impact for improved sorting and recycling, which will make possible then to increase the rates of plastic recycling. And I want to be very clear that we looked at existing technologies which can be implemented fast, such as we can create an impact fast. The work has been done like everything in CFLEX as a collaboration of many stakeholders. And those who are more interested to actually contribute to the project development and the solution to be created are those which you see on this slide as part of the action team. An action team with an agile spirit, which decided fast, run trials fast, implemented things fast. We also had partners in trials which were not necessarily uh, stakeholders of CFLEX. You see in this case, the NTCP center of Sor Sorema as equipment manufacturer. But very importantly, we chose to have expert advisors 
engineering company, um, the um, EPR schemes, or Fraunhofer Institute, together with academia partners, University of Ghent, and most recently, Maastricht University. Because what we wanted is to be solid, robust, and actionable, such as once we propose it to be implemented on the market, it can stand the challenge of the reality. Having this said, I would like to share with you the roadmap which brought us where we are today. We started in 2017 mostly with desk research and, and um, definitions of the scope, but as of 2018, we kicked off the trials plan. And we started from um, industrial size type of trials where we really wanted to understand what the technology can deliver we brought these to semi-industrial trials later in the year to validate certain first assumptions and, and parameters we established for a um, ideal process which will result in the quality recycling process. And then we narrowed down the trials to the type of size which would be characteristic for application development. Because as I said, for us for the beginning, everything which would be a new recycled polymer would have to go into a end application which makes sense from technical e economic standpoint. And once we've done this, and we were end of 2019, we started to scale up again the trials to validate all the insights which we developed and all the parameters which we established for the different process steps um, to scale it up from semi-industrial to industrial and this way to come up with a solution which is technically validated. While going through this roadmap, what this project was able to deliver, which is going to be showed in the continuation of my presentation, is really why are we doing what we're doing and what can we uh, put on the market as a result of the solution. So the why it's very simple. We really intended to address the reality of the flexible packaging household collective, which is being put on the market and then becomes waste. If we take the example of the polyethylene, which is put on the market for flexible packaging, which would be used by the household, the polyethylene represents about 3.5 metric tons and this is what makes the packaging which will become waste. And the sad reality is that as we embark on the project, only 17% of this polyethylene put on the market would get back to recycling after being um, used in the packaging and then uh, disposed by the consumer. So you see on this slide as well on the right uh, hand side that we focused on basically two types of waste streams one well established already in Europe, the so-called 310, um, which represents the film um, uh, bales, but also an emerging one, the POFLEX, which in Germany has been introduced a couple of years ago. We're seeing now emerging in other countries. The whole idea of POFLEX was to retrieve and bring back to recycling also the polypropylene containing flexible packaging. So we really wanted to work with both. And the reality on the market with this type of uh, waste streams is the following. If we take the case of 310, um, through the recycling process, numbers really show if you take average recycling uh, throughout Europe, that only 50% of the polyethylene which is retrieved from this 310 fraction would go, would find its way towards recycling in what we call robust recycling. So either garbage bags or other uh, bags um, or, or construction sheets. However, these markets are already saturated. While for the POFLEX, the reality is um, worse. And the reality is that only one third approximately stays in Europe. The rest goes to export and we dare to call it dubious export because we, it's really not clear where um, this would be recycled. And what stays in Europe, this one third, half of it would find its way into recycling in, again, 
heavily saturated markets like the park benches, the compression molding type of applications, and half would go to energy from waste. That's a picture which we had decided to change. So um, the, you, you've seen already that one key problem um, remains the fact that flexible packaging is not all collected for recycling. So how to incentivize collection for recycling is really the prerequisite to be able to then sort and send to recycling. So this is the work which we are proposing today. The quality recycling process is in essence a um, combination of four steps, each step delivered by an existing technology and each of these steps are today implemented at least in one plant throughout Europe, some of them in many plants throughout Europe, but there is no plant which has all the four in a sequence which would make it a fully blown quality recycling process and would enable to put on the market the highest quality possible um, re recyclates from flexible packaging. So these four steps or four technologies are Additional um, NIR sorting by polymer and by color from the waste, incoming waste, followed by hot washing as an additional step to the conventional wet washing for a better removal of all the um, organic residues and some of the fibers like the paper labels. The third step would be the extrusion with an extra filtration, and specifically this extra filtration delivers on a better remover of volatiles and moreover of a non-target polymer like, like barrier polymers. And last but not least, the odorization for every case in which the polymer would need to have basically no odor because of the end application targeting. So this is what the full quality recycling process would mean. And if we are to look at first for the sorting, what the quality sorting as an addition to the conventional sorting in, in a typical um, MERS, in a typical sorting plant in Europe delivers, it's the following. If we take the example of a plant which will put both BL310 and PO Flex throughout the process, then such a plant would be able to extract from the 310 at a level of minimum 25%, anywhere between 25 and 30, a grade which is so-called the P field natural fraction. And will also be left with about 60, 65% of the P flex, which would be comparable with the 310, is just that it will be less natural color in it. And at this stage already, some of the residue, which would be detrimental for the recycling quality um, later on, it's removed. And for the PO flex, um, this type of uh, quality sorting would release the polypropylene film grade, um, which then can be targeted to film applications and a so-called PO new fraction, which would seeing it directed to uh, injection molding applications. And uh, the PE film is at a percentage of about 20%. Having this said, it would be interesting now to understand, okay, um, and next slide would, would help me um, um, elaborate on this. Um, what are the results if we are starting to look also at the um, following steps? which um, represented the contamination from washing and extrusion. Um, and really the continuation would be about how um, quality recycling process delivers in increased quantity and quality of recycled polymers um, being recuperated from the flexible packaging um, put on the market. Um, and it adds into the reason to incentivize the collection for recycling. So I think um, at this point, Alec, you can introduce the one and only Kim. Yes, thank you very much, Dana, for giving us uh, uh, the outline of, of, of QRP, the what and the why, and to delve a little bit more into the details of, 
the demonstrators and their outputs. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Kim Raggett to take the floor, please, Kim. Thank you very much, Alec, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I too am extremely excited to finally be able to share all these results with you. It's been a lot of work. They are all very exciting and um, you should know about it. So what we see here today, now on the screen is first I will talk about the 310 bail and then later on about the PO flex bail. And you see here how the process goes in what we call tier one and that which Dana has explained to you is in fact tier one. So we start from the 310 bail. The first step is this additional sorting, which currently is not used uh, otherwise industrially. So we sort very actively for the PE film natural, really the transparently colored polyethylene film and everything else moves on to what you could call from the sorting process, a drop fraction. Now, what we do in this tier one is that both this pass fraction, the PE film natural, and the drop fraction, which we have called PE flex, they go through the same further recycling process with all the quality steps added. So we are putting as much effort in the drop as we are in the pass. And this is on purpose. And because in essence, by taking out this PE film natural, you could argue that we take out the top value material, and then you could be worried about what remains in the rest of the bale, can we still use it for something? But because we are adding these extra quality steps in the further recycling process, we can still increase quite significantly the properties of this PE flex, and we can definitely rival the current 310 bale. Maybe a bit on the terminology, uh, you can see that uh, at the end of the picture, there is a small R from recycled in front of the name of the material. So once it's granulates, we add the little R. While it's still in the process as sorted products, uh, we don't do that. So the sorted product PE film natural becomes the extruded regranulate RPE film natural. And this would be what a converter in the end will be able to buy in the market and then use to make products. The intention is to use this PE film natural really in high grade products like packaging film applications and to use the RPE flex in current robust film applications, but also maybe to open markets for injection molding. We have some data in the next slide on that. Okay, I have to talk you perhaps a bit through what we call this spider diagram. So these spider diagrams, they are relative comparisons of properties in which we take the properties of that which we are trying to achieve. In this case, this is the virgin polyethylene film grade, which is colored a dark purple. So the properties of this material have a value one. And then we see, is it higher or lower for the other materials? The four properties which we have put out is elastic modulus, the flexibility if the value is low or rigidity if the value is high, strain at break, how much ductility do I have, how much can I deform it, tensile strength, what is the maximum load I can apply to this material, and then dart drop uh, if I have an impact uh, on the material, how will it resist. And we have put out a comparison between quite a few materials, so there's this virgin grade, which is TDS values, then there is the current gold standard, I would say, in recycling, that is recycled polyethylene from CNI. CNI is commercial and industrial waste. It is what we typically call the post-industrial waste, which is, of course, much less mixed with other types, much cleaner, less contaminated, etc. It counts as being the high-quality polyethylene in the market for recycling. We've also put out in blue, the light blue, the properties of the current 310 bale. So if you take the entire 310 bale and recycle it as it is done today, what is the uh, properties of that material? And they typically go uh, into the robust applications like garbage bags. And then in our, in our green color, we have the properties of the RPE film natural. And we can see a lot of things happening in these spiders. The first thing you have to realize is that high is not always better, especially when looking at this elastic modulus. High values means it's actually quite rigid as a material. So the fact that we are there able to bring down this um, modulus to bring down this stiffness means that it is much more film-like, much more a flexible type material. And of course, that is because the process takes out a lot of the non-polyethylene contaminations. And we can really see how the shape um, of this yeah, square-like thing for the RP film natural is, no, 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 uh, uh, is moving much more towards the shape and the properties of the 
uh, virgin PE and the RPE from CNI. It's not exactly there, obviously, but it comes much closer. And we are already looking forward a little. You can see there that the pallets of sodas who are being wrapped. And so we can really use this RPE film natural for applications for which the RPE 310 was not fit at all, like this uh, shrink wrap on the pallet. So that's really good news for this high quality, which we actively sort out this RPE film natural. But let's see what happens to the rest of it. Uh, what happens to the RPE flex. Uh, we've called it RPE flex <clears throat> because it is very suitable for flexible type applications and we want to make the differentiation from the film natural. So it's not natural in color, it, it's a bit grayish as you have when you combine all colors. Ignore the spider for a moment. I want to say something about uh, the left bottom. So this RPE flex, we can have a look. Can we also make uh, robust film applications like garbage bags from this RPE flex. We've done some trials, both in my previous lab in Ugent, but also in some industry labs, uh, sorry, industrial uh, installations of C-Flex partners. And we can, in fact, blow film, we can blow garbage bags with this material. However, we're not entirely satisfied yet with the properties, especially dart drop, I feel, uh, is a bit of an issue. Um, but also this does not worry me overly much because so far we have been using 100% of the RPE flex material to try and make these bags. Well, we know that in common industrial practice with 310, there is also a certain amount of blending with either virgin or material from CNI. So we are now setting up these trials to also make that happen. But I don't feel that that should be our focus entirely. Yeah? There's more to the world than uh, these robust applications. And since we now for the first time have this polyethylene heavy recycled stream, which has high flexibility, we can also look to the flexible injection molding market. And that's where we can look again at this spider. So what does the spider say? The spider, the purple is again, a virgin grade suitable for flexible injection molding. So flexible for polyethylene. This is products like, like caps and closures. Uh, you can see there are laundry baskets as a consumer product. That's the type of product we do in injection molding via polyethylene. Also the spider is on injection molding data. The spider on the previous slide was on blown film data. So we have this gold reference of the virgin PE. Uh, as the current recycling quality, I took properties of an existing mixed polyolefin in the market, which is also heavy on polyethylene, uh, which is coming from film. And there you see very typically, it's very narrow. It goes very high in modulus, very high in strength, but very narrow in ductility and in impact resistance. So these are materials who are typically much stiffer. You can see it twice as stiff as the virgin polyethylene, but also very brittle, in fact. And that makes them, that means that if, if they have an impact, they will break very easily. So they are not suitable for a lot of products who require flexing and who require toughness. However, by um, doing all these steps in the QRP process, you can see again that there's this very narrow diamond, it's really opening up. Now we are moving towards the properties more of the virgin type. And that makes this uh, material suitable even for this um, injection molding of flexible products. So in essence, that's quite promising. We're not done testing it out, but it means that we could move away from only bringing this type of material to the park benches, which I would call <clears throat> the robust recycling. You can see the picture there, and that is typically what the material in blue today is going to. So that's a good product, no problem, but we want more uh, because it's a saturated market. Let's have a look now at um, first the tier two approach. And I'm introducing this here because it will come back in the business case arguably say that you still want to make these park benches or these bulk products then maybe the cost of doing this entire tier one approach on the pe flex fraction is not worth it to you then of course nothing is stopping you from in fact um treating this pe flex fraction the way you would today treat the materials coming from the 310 bale with the conventional cold washing basic extrusion no deodorization of course be aware and that for example odor will not be as good as it was with the tier one approach but this will be picked up again in the business case i would now like to have a look at the po bale and what we can do there um, and this is actually 
very exciting. Uh, people have been working on doing valuable things with the 310 bail for a long time, but this PO bail until now has been quite neglected. It has either been going into the robust uh, intrusion applications like the park benches, or it has been exported and we're not always, always sure what happens to it then. So the fact that we are now hunting for the polypropylene film in this PO bail is really exciting to me because it puts a new fraction on the market. And so similar to what we did to the 310 bail, we are actively sorting out in a post-sorting step the polypropylene film. And so this is our pass fraction. This is then going through all the quality steps again, and then we get a granulate RPP film, which is suitable for, in fact, uh, quite demanding film applications like BOPP. The drop fraction, we have called this PO nu. Why PO nu? Because there is already a mixed polyolefin fraction in the market, which has similar types of compositions, uh, PE, PP mixed. Uh, but this is a new fraction. It comes from um, this film origin and it is purified through the QRP process. So we call it PO nu to give it a bit of a differentiation to existing mixed polyolefin grades. Also, this goes through our entire QRP process. We have a granulate, and for that granulate, we will again be investigating new markets focused this time on injection mold. But first, let's have a look at the RPP film and the properties. More spiders for you. Um, so every time the spider properties are on this type of film, Let's go back. Yeah, yeah. Let's stay. Let's stay here for a while. Huh? So we have looked together with the action team of um, uh, CFLEX. We have looked at two types of application for uh, PP film. That is simple cast film on the right and BO by oriented PP film um, on the left. Different types of properties are relevant there. We are always still comparing in purple to a virgin grade, which is known as a very suitable grade for this type of application. And we do not have here the blue color, which was the current recyclate on the market because it simply does not exist. And so this is really a new market segment which is being opened. The properties which we have for the BOPP are the modulus always, rigidity and stiffness, strain and break, the ductility, tensile strength, maximum force you can put on it, but also thermal shrinkage is important here, uh, how much will it shrink during my processing after the stretching, obviously. And then for the cast film, it is modulus, strain and break, uh, and strength, the very typical basic properties. And we can see there again, uh, for cast film, we're getting quite close on the right, which is the triangle. Oh, we, this triangle is really moving very nicely towards the virgin PP. You also have some uh, processing pictures there. And also for the BOPP, we are not exactly at those properties, but coming close enough uh, that uh, in a combination, perhaps with a small amount of virgin, we can put this material in the market. So we can look at these new markets. And then the most challenging material is this RPU new. Uh, so what are we going to do with this? And comparably, uh, is it the same as what is currently in the market as mixed polyolefins, which is going to a lot of bulk application? Or is it in fact better? And can we do a little more with that? Can we take on more challenging uh, products? And we can. Uh, we've done quite a lot of trials, both in the lab at Ugent, but also with some uh, companies. So first looking at the spider, again, the virgin, we've referenced here to a virgin HDPE, which is a bit off in the sense that, um, yeah, we know that there isn't that much HDP in the material which uh, is coming from our process. But if you look at rigid applications in injection molding, it makes more sense to compare. It's more honest to compare to virgin uh, HDP. In the light blue, we have the baseline current mixed polyolefins coming from rigid mixtures of PP uh, and PE. That is why they have, relatively speaking, a higher modulus than the material we have. But as it was the case for uh, flexible mixed polyolefins. The, really the breaking points for these type of materials is um, ductility and toughness. When it is hit with an impact, can it tolerate that? So it was a, in light blue for the baseline, a very narrow spectrum. And you can see again that this process with the RPO, RPO new is drawing it open more towards the virgin material. We have much better impact strength. It's really an extremely significant improvement. And also strain at break goes from very low to quite reasonable levels. Also, we were able to injection mold it. You have there different types of products. The ones which are in the back in the top picture are a green tile. It's a roof tile uh, for green roofs. We made some cups. Uh, we made some uh, 
connector pieces, double phalange piece, which you see there. And these are injection molding products. And I know uh, you will argue, I hope, that we are taking materials from flexibles. They have relatively low MFIs, but you can play quite well with your processing parameters, even without additives like peroxides, uh, and make them injectable very well. The one I'm especially proud of is the one at the bottom. This trial was done by uh, the company Pesi in the Netherlands for the company Omega Green, which is in, in uh, greenhouse uh, applications. And it's a double sort of connector, which has a screw thread on it. So it really needs to be precise. It will be shown later in the demonstrators what this product does, but we could really injection mold this very well. And it turns out to be extremely functional. But even here also, if you say, okay, I don't want to go to all these, these fancy products, or for me, maybe odor is not that important. Nothing is stopping us from uh, using this PO flex material in what we call then the tier two approach. And so the lower uh, effort putting in there uh, in the recycling of your material, you can also do that. And then you will also get out qualities that allow you to make products, but you have to take into account that, um, well, yeah, you have spent less effort upgrading the material so you will get to some degree a lower quality out there. I think more or less that sums up the, the qualities and the results and there has been a lot of lab work in this. So this is the RPE film natural, which has been made into a shrink film. 30% uh, recycled content has been blended in of our material. So it was converted and by Plastotechnica. It is meant for shrink film around uh, Pepsi bottles. And you can see here, it's performing extremely well. Also, if you tilt the palette, it was doing uh, quite awesome. So that is very promising also because and this threshold of 30%, I know for many companies is quite important. Again, the RPE film natural, it has also been included at this important level of 30% in sealable pouches. It has been blended in. You can see uh, the product right there. It works smoothly, no hiccups in the production. So this was absolutely fine. <coughs> Apologies. Moving on. Um, this is the trial with the RPE Flex. Uh, Alex is running it while I am still talking. So this is where you can really see the production uh, trial where the bags are, of course, already folded now where you see them. But the bags in the RPE Flex, so the drop material, from the process on the 310 has here been processed industrially into garbage bags. And also this process runs quite smoothly. You can see the balloon being blown in the back um, right now. We are still setting up further investigations here uh, on exactly what properties are coming out of that process. And we have more industrial trials planned. The PP, so the material from the PO flex bale, the pass fraction there, which is actively sorted out, is the PP film. Um, fraction. And I think this one is really awesome. I had these pouches in my office. Uh, they're absolutely wonderful. So this is the material at 23%. In this case, the RPP is going into a BOPP structure and uh, you packaging people out there are going to know this is really quite challenging with recycled material to go to this BOPP. It was done by Tahleef Industries um, and uh, works again wonderfully well. The PP can also be used in labels. Here we pass again the 30% uh, the barrier, uh, again done by Tahleef. You can see, you cannot see that it is recycled, uh, that it has the recycled content. It has beautiful aesthetical properties. It's very functional. It wraps around, it has been presented before. So also this is actually quite impressive eh? because again, this RPP is only now being introduced into conversion. Uh, it really is a new material segment for recycling. And then uh, also pressure sensitive labels. So these are different types of labels and labels which really uh, are uh, not, not tied to themselves, but are put on um, the products here. Another uh, realization by Tagleaf, also here more than 30% of the RPP being in there. I know this is a lot of uh, examples coming very fast, but we just have so many and we're so proud. Uh, and then the injection molding. Uh, so we are looking at this injection molding potential applications for the RPE Flex and the RPO New. 
the ones at the top are the images of the pictures uh, either from my lab or the trials in the Netherlands. And there you can see at the right what this uh, connector piece that I was talking to is being used for us. So it's actually welded into a water bag. And this is really as a column of six meters of water, which is pressuring down on this uh, tap. And then on the, um, the screw thread is connected this sort of quick connect piece where a water hose is later clicked in to take out the water. And this is used uh, in irrigation in greenhouses. It's been tested in functional environment. It is perfectly functional. And then we are still too fast. Um, we are still doing trials and identifying more markets. We are looking at irrigation pipes. We are looking at pallets. Uh, we are looking at home and gardening applications. And if anyone here is looking at these slides now and thinks, hey, wait, I have a product where we could test this material. Just get in touch with me and I will gladly help you to set up this trial. So if I summarize all of that, uh, what have we been doing in the quality assessment and the product uh, development? Um, we have been looking at ways to go away from this current situation where in the end, uh, the plastics are either going only to robust recycling or there's a lot of residue which is simply lost to us and goes at best to uh, incineration. Or in the case of the PO flex bale, you can see the orange bar, a lot is actually going to export. We're not sure what happens to that. When we go below the line, we introduce the QRP process. We suddenly get fractions that go to high quality demanding applications. Those are the light greens. Of course, we still have some residues, but we also still have this amount of material that can go to more robust application. And you can see uh, robust is shrinking. In, um, losses and residues is shrinking and this space is being taken up now by high quality materials and we're only just starting we've been doing this for a few years which in the sense of setting up new recycling processes is not that long so i'm expecting that every year we are going to be able to give you better and better results i think now that is in fact it for me thank you very much Indeed, a huge thank you to you, Kim, um, for illustrating what less waste and more quality looks like in reality, uh, but also bringing those spider graphs to, to life for us so beautifully. Um, I think we've seen a few of those benefits in the outputs. And as you also alluded to, how much does it cost? Uh, always the, the golden question. And uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Stephen de Maester here to take us through some of the business modeling and its model in application. So Stephen, over to you, please. Okay, Alec, thank you for uh, this introduction. And also me, I'm very happy to be able to present here today the work of uh, the last year that we did, the hard work and the efforts together with the CFLEX consortium to uh, make this uh, cost calculations. Um, so indeed, I hear you thinking that's all well and nice. Uh, we make uh, higher qualities uh, and we increase the recycling rates from these difficult film fractions, these waste film fractions. So the real question is, can we afford this? Is this affordable? So this will be um, the content of my presentation. So um, my presentation consists of three parts. Um, if you would skip to there, um, then the first part is important that of course, the, the um, processes, they are not in place yet. So we can do an economic analysis on an existing plant here. But we have built a flexible model to predict the material flows and the economics of a sorting and recycling plant. So in the first part of my presentation, I will explain you how this model works. So you will be able to understand how the results that I will show later are uh, developed. In the next part, I will apply the model and in the end, the interpretation, I will show you uh, what comes out of the business case of the QRP. So first, how the model works. It consists actually of, a, of course, as any model, you have a user input. And in this case, it's a bit of geeky slide, apologies for that, but it's important to understand how we get to the result. So the user input is in fact, what is the waste composition? So you can actually do it at a product level or product category level. So the waste composition, the, the, the bill, how it would enter the QRP recycling process. Next, of course, you have to enter how does the QRP or the recycling process look like? So the layout of the sorting and recycling plant. So in this analysis, we have focused, of course, on the QRP as was presented before. We will go a bit more in detail to that. Then the output of that is what are the material flows, the yields of sorting and recycling. 
um, and what are the residues, but also what are the compositions, and we can also predict the economic and environmental balance. So the key of the model, of the core of the model, is in the middle, is consists of a list of equipment. So the typical equipment you find in sorting and recycling plants. So this is the near sensors, this is ballistic separator sieves, uh, wash uh, float sink steps and extruders and so on. So the typical recycling processes of the current recycling world. For every of these equipment, we have what is so-called split factors. I will go deeper into that. But basically, this means for every product that or every material that you have in the input waste, how efficiently is it separated with this process? Also, we have the operational cost of the equipment and the capital cost of, the, of uh, buying this and installing this equipment. On the bottom, you see we also have some carbon footprint factors to, in the end, perform the LCA, but this is not the scope of the presentation today, and this is work ongoing, but it's uh, the potential of the model. And also, of course, we have the factory overheads. Okay, I will just explain two things a bit more in depth on the model. So first, the split factors. Um, split factors basically mean that we have this list of equipment, um, which could be the near sensors, as you will see on the next slide, where uh, don't stare too much on uh, to these numbers. But what you see is we can enter any composition, which can be a PP flexible, which can be a PE flexible or a, a kind of residue. And then we have a positive sorting and a negative sorting. For example, here is a near given how efficient is a near to separate PP uh, flexible from uh, a bale. But we also have the miss sorting, and this is also crucial to know how much is miss sorted in this kind of equipment because they, in the end, form the contamination in your end product. So first you see there the example of the PP positive sorting and then the near PO negative sorting. And where you would see we, in the near PO negative sorting, we recover 90% of the PE and PP, but we have a 10% loss. But of course, which is not indicated on the slide, you are able to remove many of the contaminants with this kind of equipment. I'm not going too deep on this. I also don't want to pinpoint the exact numbers on this slide. But on the bottom left of the previous slide, you will see that there is a big it's a bit blurred now. It's not the, uh, the intention to actually make this very visible. But you see in the column, in the rows, you see all types of inputs in a, what you can have in a bale, so basically types of waste. And in the columns, you can see the separation processes, which could be NIRS or ballistic separators or sink floats, etc. And for every of these processes, we have for every product the positive separation. So how much can we actually positively get out, but also how much is it negatively or missorted in this step. So this is the key of the material flow analysis. And then next, of course, as we have this on the equipment level, um, we can also add the costs of this. Um, we added the cost of each equipment. And on the next slide, you will see that um, the cost database consists of pure equipment costs, which means there is an install equipment cost, but also, the, yeah, of course, the, the cost to install this equipment and make it operational in a plant. And we have OPEX factors like the electricity consumption, gas consumption, or whatever the utilities this process needs. In the middle column, you see that there's also some overhead factors. So, for example, how much hours are we uh, running? Uh, what is the water cost, the electricity cost? How much labor do we need? And so on. And on the right, and this is very important, this will come back in also the results slides. These are the prices of the regranulates. Of course, very sensitive, a bit volatile. So as it is a model, luckily, we are also able to work with price or revenue ranges eh, for how much do we sell the actual um, recyclate. And this is important because we can talk with Kim and with the others on, on the qualities. What can we make for it? How much can we sell it? And this we can put then in the model. So I can say that in the last year, we had quite some iterations in, in new markets that are applied, new prices, and so on. We here have central value, low value, high value based on the prices of the last five years. Um, but we try to work with ranges to get some insight in the cost benefit of these kind of processes. Okay. So this is the basic model structure. And then we go to the QRP analysis. So as mentioned there on the bottom of the slide, there is a database then full of the split factors. But now we go to the QRP business case. First, what did we put in, in the model? First is the waste composition, of course. And we start from the DSD310 bill and the PO uh, bill, the PO flex bill, the 323. 
And on the next slide, you will see the two slide, the two pi diagrams. I will not go too much into that, but these are typical compositions of a 310 bill and a 323 bill. They were sampled in uh, last year, in 2020. Um, and of course, these can change. You all know that that waste is, is a bit diverse in composition, but here we actually sampled 310 and 323 bills. What you see with the 310 bill is that around 50% of the dark green is PE transfer transparent film, 26% is still PE film, so meaning that we have more than 70, 75% PE in this bill. And then of course we have other uh, factors, other yeah, polymers and other residues in this bill as with any waste stream. The 323 bill we all know is a very complicated bill. So we not only have, we have a bit of PE transparent and a bit of other PE, but also PP and 11% other plastics there as well. So quite a complicated waste stream, but still around 50% of polyolefin and quite a concentrated polypropylene uh, film, which is then what we might try to target, 17% uh, of polypropylene. So this is the waste composition that we entered in the model in the calculations that you will see later on. Of course, we can adjust them and that's just uh, exactly the value of having a model. Then there is the layout of the sorting and recycling plants. Um, so first the sorting. I think you have, well, in the past slides, you've already seen that there is additional near sorting. And on the next slide, you see exactly how we modeled this process. So basically we kept the 310 and the 323 bill separate. So in the top two lines, you see two parallel lines, similar lines, where we start from the 310 bill, we go, go it over a magnet and a screen, and then we really target with the near, the LDPE, and, uh, the PE film natural. Then afterwards, we clean the rest of the PE, which, which gives us the PE film, the PE flex bill. Then on the bottom, you see again, two parallel lines of 323. And what's quite unique there of the QRP process is that actually the PP is cleaned from this bill. So we get a new bill, which is the PP film bill, which we can send to a recycler. The drops of all this, and because kind of we picked the cherries, the PE film natural or the PP film, uh, we still make a very clean PE flex bill, as was already indicated in the previous presentation, but the drops then go to what is called this PU new bill. Okay, this is a sorting step, the QRP is sorting. Afterwards, we go to the QRP recycling chain. There we can choose, either we go for a tier one, which basically is a washing step, but the washing is with the cold washing, hot washing, and then of course the density separation and the uh, double filter extrusion with the uh, deodorization. The tier two is a bit more simple, I would say the cheaper option, which, be, which could be for some applications sufficient, which is just a cold washing with the single melt filtration. And of course we can choose which of uh, the sorted bales we sent to which type of tire one or tire two recycling, which we have also done in the modeling. But of course, today uh, in this time slot, we will only show one of these results. Okay, then what comes out of the model? Firstly, I will show you a bit on one slide on the material flows and the compositions, but then I have a few slides on the economics because this is probably more interesting for the most of you. But the material flow analysis, we have here visualized in a Sankey diagram, you see that we make on the top there, this new bale, the PE film natural. And in the bottom, you see the PP film, uh, the new fraction PP, and you still see the amounts of PE flex and PO new that are generated. So basically we get quite some high sorting grades from this recycling process. We also get the composition. And on the right, you see, on the top right, you see the composition of the PE film natural. This runs out of the model. So every waste composition that you put in the model, we can see on every product level or every material type level, how they are separated through this line and in which bill they're gonna end up. So this shows us that with this setup in this sorting plant, QRP sorting plant, we get a really clean PE natural film fraction. Of course, after all this extensive sorting. And also what we see is that the PP film bill is quite nice in uh, composition. You see a quite clean PP bill there. Okay, I'm not going to dive too deep in the exact numbers, but we can see, we can exactly follow, of course, the flow of these waste streams and bales through this kind of recycling plants. And this allows us also, of course, to further play with this. But this is what we locked in the current uh, model and what we are presenting in the economic factors that will follow. Okay, then to the economics. Um, as mentioned, yeah, we also can work later on on the environmental balance, but in this presentation, we show mainly the economics. Here you see the capital investment. 
So we normalize the capital investment in ton input capacity. So everything you will see is in ton input. And here it's about capacity. So it's not depreciated over the years or so. This is per ton capacity. So the QRP is the sorting and the uh, tier one and tier two recycling as you have has been presented before. What you there see on the right is the baseline is important because currently there is already a recycling world. Of course, there is still improvement needed in the overall recycling rate, but there are recycling factories actually recycling films. So we compare always with the baseline. And what we see within the baseline uh, is that there is a bit of sorting cost. Many film recyclers have a magnet and uh, a NIR or one NIR, but here, of course, in the QRP, we have this more extensive sorting. So, which means that the capital cost for the sorting, the, which is the green on the bottom left uh, bar, so is around 200 euro capital investment per ton capacity. What you also see is, if you compare the left to the right, is that there is the yellow bar and then the orange bar. Uh, you see that the orange bar is the hot washing, which is, of course, not always common in many recycling factors. So you see, of course, that installing and investing in a hot washing step will cost more, that's for sure. And next, also the, the green going to the top there, you see that the regranulation will also cost more because you have a double melt filtration. This is not surprising because we are installing more recycling processes. So we have a capital investment, which is, I would say, a bit less than a factor two higher than the regular baseline scenario. Okay, this is capital investment. Now the next slide will focus on the operational cost. So this is operational cost including the depreciation per ton input processed. Yeah, so this is how you would actually typical recycling uh, factories talk. Uh, what is the cost to process one ton? So here we see a bit similar trends. Uh, you see indeed that you have a cost you should for the sorting, for, like, for example, if you look to the 310, you should look to the green on the bottom there and then a bit of blue, which is the building of the sorting, the new sorting QRP. You also need, of course, to build the building and you have the overhead costs and so on and you have bill handling. So in total, we see around, let's say, 150 euros per ton that we have to add for this extensive sorting. Furthermore, you see that the 310, there is the additional cost of the washing. You see the yellow and the orange uh, bar, they are higher than what you would expect in the baseline. Because we go to the hot washing, we have sent everything on the 310, we have sent to the tier one recycling. That's important to know. We have tried in this scenario to make the highest quality possible. So send every of this 310 bill through the tier one recycling. Of course, here you can still play afterwards if you would see the tier two would be sufficient. And but DSE 310, we all go to tier one. And then the regranulation again is a bit more expensive. In total, we end up with a cost of around 520 euro per ton to process this through a QRP sorting and recycling line, which is indeed 170 euros more expensive than the baseline scenario. You have a lower sorting cost. You don't have the hot washing step that's accounted in there. So this is, of course, cheaper. What you also see, the 323 is a bit in the middle there. We only sent the PP to the, the tier one recycling, the tier one recycling, so to the hot wash. So of course, the orange part there is a bit smaller because less amount of mass is going to this hot washing and double melt filtration. So we see, indeed, the cost is more expensive. This was expected. But how bad is this? And this is actually, I would say, more or less the concluding slide of our work. So this is of the 310. So we separated here the 310. And on the next slide will be the 323. What you see, the QRP cost, I've explained on the last slide, on the previous slide, you see that the QRP cost, so the total left bar, you have around 150 euros of sorting and then around 350 euros to through the, do this through a tier one recycling plant. But then what is the revenue? And of course, this is important. You make a higher cost, will we get a higher revenue? Here, of course, we all know that the recycling and the regranulate world, you have a bit of volatile price. So what we did is we mimicked or we, we included some market fluctuations in the selling price. These fluctuations are on the bottom, but of course, as this is a model, we can uh, adjust these numbers when prices would change. But what we see, we have 150 euro extra cost for the QRP process amongst uh, approximately. But also what we see, if you look to the revenue bars, so which is the combination of the green and the blue, the green stands on the, on the left uh, chart for the revenue from the PE natural and the dark blue stands for the PE flex of this 310 bill. We see if we sum this up, in total, we get around break even in the central value. So minus 17 euro per ton is there. 
But if the selling prices are higher and you see there the higher values at the bottom, then we come to a profit of 73 euros per ton or a net balance of 73 euros per ton. If you look to the current baseline scenario, we see in the central value again, so the, the right bar, the right chart, you see the central value approximately the same minus eight, minus 17 is in the same order of magnitude. And if the prices are a bit higher, you see there are 60 euro per ton uh, net revenue or net cost balance for this uh, baseline recycling scenario. But what is important to see here is, and that's really crucial to understand. So the, in fact, the net balance is, let's say a bit similar to the baseline case, but what, what is very important, we have in the QRP 150 euro ex extra cost, but we, can also have an 150 euro or a bit more extra revenue, depending of course on the sale price. So this extra revenue, this extra value that you get out of the waste actually compensates for this. So we are in the same order of magnitude. And that's, I think in the circular economy is quite crucial. We have increased recycling rates and still the, cost, the net balance is uh, quite similar. And of course we can, we can play with the scenarios, but this is a very important conclusion to me that it's actually worth the effort. Okay, to the next slide. Uh, there I will talk a bit to the 323. Of course, this is a more difficult bail. This was always the most difficult bail eh, because the composition was already more complicated than the 323. But here we still try to take the effort and get extra material out of there. And we see the cost is a bit less than 500 euro per ton to do this extra sorting. Uh, and here you see next to the pink, you also see a bit of yellow because here the PO would go more to a cold wash or to a tier two recycling chain. So we see it's a bit cheaper and then the three, uh, but it's still around a bit less than 500 euro to process one ton. And we see that the selling price, we have a revenue there from the PP bill, which is new. And we have revenue from the PO bill, right, which was Kim explaining that we have still applications for this. Um, and here we see a net negative balance, but we have to take into account that this is also excluding the gate fee. And so we see, we still get value out. Again, very important, we get value out in total. We recycle more and we get a slightly negative, but not very negative value on this bill. And the recycling rates go up. And this, this is of course key and then to play with the 310 and the 323. So this is basically the conclusion of my, our work that we have done. I would say uh, after analyzing this QRP process, uh, this is a promising alternative route for flexible packaging collection. We have created extra value from the same tonnage of waste without uh, jeopardizing basically the net balance, cost benefit balance of our process. So we, because we pick higher value products from this, we create a higher value. And this is not only important purely for the net value, but also because we have extra markets that we can open by doing this, eh? because some markets get saturated. And here we really pick qualities, we sort and recycle qualities where we can enter new recycling markets. And we have increased the overall recycling rate of flexible packaging by this process. Next to, of course, the uh, quality recycling process. We are happy that with, uh, together with the uh, CFLEX members, we have developed this model to calculate business cases. I think this is very important because this is an evolving field and we can actually come to new insights as we do more research, we do more tests, we can adjust the model, we can adjust qualities, costs, we can include more or less sorting and recycling equipment and so on. So we, can, we'll, we will also the variations in the input composition that we might expect, we can deal with this. So this offers a lot of opportunities also in the future. Future. And then in the, as my last words, I would like to thank, of course, uh, well, mainly also Irdanto and Michael who have done, uh, of CFLEX and Irdanto of Ghent University have done a, a lot of this work, but also, and very importantly, I would like to thank all the CFLEX consortium members and stakeholders that gave input in our work, because I'm very happy to collaborate with the CFLEX consortium, because there is very positive vibe to increase this recycling rate in flexible packaging. There is an open atmosphere. We try to really science-based, looking to facts, looking to tests, and not just talking about recycling, but really dive deep into it. And in an open, good collaborative atmosphere, we really try to increase the recycling rates of flexible packaging. So thanks for uh, listening. Thank you to you, Stephen, and uh, indeed the Mike, uh, the team uh, who have been working on this. It's uh, an incredibly impressive model and work to be done. And uh, thank you for your conclusions there. We've seen a lot of content from Dana, Kim, 
and, and Stephen. So perhaps I could just quickly turn to Dana to give us a quick recap of some of these uh, this content, and then we'll progress and speak to a few of the action team that have been putting into practice on the ground. So Dana, over to you. So I really have to thank uh, both Kim and Stephen for their very insight insightful uh, presentations, which I hope that by now had proven to you uh, the conclusion of uh, our work, which is really that we're seeing in this solution, we are recommended as a so-called quality recycling process, a way to truly enable a much greater percentage of the flexible packaging to be returned to the economy in the quantities and the qualities which can meet the requirements of new end markets, which otherwise could not be addressed with household collected uh, flexible packaging um, type of waste. We are seeing this as a big step forward in making flexible packaging more circular. Obviously, the journey is not at the end. It is a journey and like everything in recycling, it uh, has continuously many ways for um, further developments and improvement. So I would like also to share with you, um, aside from uh, the key conclusions, which would be on the next slide, please. Um, yeah, let me just spend a, a, a moment reminding the key conclusions. Um, this is a solution to further incentivize the collection for recycling of flexible packaging. We see that it really powers a shift uh, to quantity and quality uh, instead of just driving quantity in recycling because it drives value creation with a higher quality of recyclates for proven applications. It does lower re residue of energy from waste and helps create economic value, which can support the investment in additional capacity. It's really a solution which offers the potential to flex the output quantity and quality um, coming out for, of recycling of flexible packaging to match the demands of the end applications. So um, all of this, as I said, it's not the end of the journey. And the journey continues now with more work which you're doing to further the development of end applications. I'm gonna cite here what a friend of mine from a brand owner said recently in a Packaging Europe webinar. When you do innovation, when you develop new applications, including applications with um, flexible, sorry, with recyclate, you need to do all the work to truly develop to the end the applications. So more work is ahead of us, but we are confident with the results today that we're gonna get to the destination we target. In order to, to continue this end application development, we are completing now the large scale trials um, to produce more material, which then converters and brand owners can have for the development. But uh, most importantly, we are now embarking into our new project, the continuation of developing the solution with building an industrial scale demonstration plant in Europe with a goal to be running commercially by end of 2023. This is meant to help us demonstrate at large industrial scale the economical viability of the solution and really provide a true incentivization from all involved in this for the design for recycling of flexible packaging. If there aren't markets, if there is an economic model, then, then it's a very good reason to accelerate the redesign for recycling of flexible packaging. So for this, new stage of the project, we're looking for partners. Everyone in the audience, everyone out there who is listening to us, it's invited to join us. If you find an interest to be part of the team to co-design this uh, demonstration plan, to co-fund the demonstration plan, we're looking for partners in the waste management would be the right candidate to manage and eventually own such a plan. Having this said, um, I think, Alec, it's time to move to the next stage of the webinar. Super. Yes. Yeah. So if you are interested in taking that next step and the future collaborations, then please contact Dana uh, or one of the team or anyone in the action team, indeed. And uh, speaking of the action team, uh, at this time, I'd like to 
turn and we've again heard reference to the, the network of stakeholders that have made this a reality. I'm very pleased to have four of them with us here today to elaborate a little bit about their expectations, challenges and even solutions that they've come across and a little bit of a look into what's the future. So uh, I'll welcome everyone up onto the, the, the virtual stage here. And perhaps I can start with the point of view of uh, the sort of the beginning of the value chain in, in CFLEX terms. And uh, uh, if uh, Isabel from, from Dow, you might be able to give us a few insights. Yeah, really from the technical perspective, I think that the key takeaway that the quality recycling process action team deliver can be summarized in one, in just one image. And for me, that image is, if we apply quality recycling process, we can obtain a high quality recycled polyethylene that can be used, for example, in collation frame, as we have seen in the slide. But if we remain as we are today, we will continue delivering only recycled polyethylene for applications like garbage bag. So ex using existing technology, but starting for the sorting and sorting this natural polyethylene, it is possible to obtain a high quality recycled polyethylene, meaning high quality, better mechanical properties and better aesthetics. Has been demonstrated at the semi-industrial scale within the action team that 30% of this material can replace virgin polyethylene and go into the bundling of beverage bottles. Dow has been participating on the quality recycling process and in the action team. And our contribution has been the characterization of the recyclates and the proposal of the new applications for this recycled polyethylene. But certainly has been to the power of the full collaboration of the value chain that we have here. And as you have seen now, the power of integrating the academia for the development of new applications for this recycled material. So the deliver is better quality and better quantity. And really looking to the future, we need to incorporate more partners in order to build the demo at an industrial scale for the better quality, for the better quantity, and more important, to validate the business models that has been shared today. I look forward to that extended collaboration. Thank you very much, Isabel. And uh, circularity is all about that complex way of, of uh, collaboration. So thank you for uh, recalling that as well as your insights. If we move a little bit further down the value chain, Monica and Maria, uh, you've both been upfront and personal with a lot of these demonstrators and working with them. So perhaps I could turn to you first, uh, Maria, to, to give us a few uh, words about your experiences. Yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting us to participate in this fantastic event, to share our insight base on the trial made at Innotech, our R&D center for Cospan and Sur. So from a sustainability standpoint, this process has been very satisfactory since it has proven that the recycled material is perfectly fine to use at an industrial level. And by so in the market that the circular economy really works. And speaking from a converter and printing company perspective, we have to say that the printability of the material was very good and were not any issue in doing so. Some adjustments need to be made on the industrial machines to achieve the correct spot distance. However, we have to have light that this is the standard with new materials, nothing to do with the recycling content. Uh, of course, in this case, in this trial, we're printing with rotogravure technology, but of course, it's also possible to do in flexography or also others. And in regards with the cutting process, uh, it was run with the standard parameters. So finally, uh, the lab test, we achieved the green light for quality control, what is so important also. No? Uh, this means mainly elongation, coefficient of friction, visual inspection, and so on. And 
As a conclusion, with our broad expertise as converters, we have to say that the performance of the recycling materials didn't show any difference from the virgin one. And talking about the future, we don't expect any issue, even if we increase the recycling content in the material. So that is the, the, great, uh, the great news here. Thank you. Some important perspectives there. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Monica, turning to you, we heard Tagleaf mentioned in quite a few of those demonstrators, and you've been a key part of this process. Perhaps uh, uh, you can share a few insights with the, the audience. Thank you, Alec. Yes, definitely, we were very happy and proud to join the action team in using for the very first time RPP content in a BOPP application. What is fantastic is not only that we keep the, the value of the material in the circle, so we preserve the value of the material and we don't lose it, but we make it also possible and we prove that we can go with this new type of material for very valuable applications. You mentioned correctly that there were uh, a few examples, so for existing high value applications like in labels, so wraparound labels were also uh, Maria uh, with her team contributed. Uh, then we had also pressure sensitive applications and last but not least also pouches made of PP, uh, which can go for no food applications like dishwasher tablets and so on. So I think that what the QRP demonstrated is that with the right quality, uh, of recycled polypropylene, it is indeed possible to go for very demanding processes like the one that you have in case of a, a BOPP film, which uh, actually is stretched in both directions. So in case you have you know, inclusions, you could have holes in the films, but this was not the case. Uh, the film was tested not only by ourselves, but uh, Kim mentioned, I think, very widely all the tests which have been carried out on the final samples, on the film itself, and the properties were in line with what would it, we would expect on, uh, let's say, on a, on a film made 100% using virgin material. So indeed, uh, very proud and happy to support the initiative, all the work and efforts which have been made uh, within the, the World Stream number three, so the QRP process, and to support the, let's say, the message that it is necessary to keep the value of plastics in the loop, and that with the right process, we can really go and look for more demanding applications and no longer stick to the mature and, let's say, or, or not, not, let's say, um, new applications, but uh, the, the, the old ones, traditional ones. So it is possible to go beyond, to look for something more, and it has been validated. And for sure, we know that stakeholders are looking forward to the next step and to the next trial uh, phase. Perfect. I think that's uh, pushing for more is, is, is the way we should be going and quicker as well. And so this next stage is very important. Thank you for everything you've been doing. Kim mentioned that she has these pouches on her desk. I too have them on my desk. And uh, indeed, uh, it's, it's great, great to see those things becoming a reality. Um, if I can turn perhaps to the most integral part of this, Barry, you're, you're, you're working with an environmental and waste management company. What's, what's your take um, in this part of the value chain? Yeah, like, uh, <clears throat> sorry, thanks for the opportunity uh, to also add some words to, uh, to this webinar. I think at first, uh, my compliments to, uh, to Kim and Stephen for a very good explanation of the process and the results. Uh, um, as a Tero, we are being present in, um, in CFLEX from the early beginning. And I know it's not so easy to explain and highlight and the right things. So uh, again, my compliments for all of them. Um, yeah, and in the end, uh, how we look at it, <clears throat> um, I'm glad that we showed that with the QRP process, we can see that much more is possible. As a Tero, we already use part of these uh, extra steps, by example, hot wash, uh, and, we, and we confirm that we see the difference. So we can also confirm that if you add these extra steps, 
better materials um, will be uh, become available. But we also have to accept and realize that the recycling chain is a puzzle. And if you take out one piece, it will affect all the others. So that's important. <clears throat> so we also have proven that high quality mechanical recycled recyclates can be produced, um, giving space to much more materials to be reused in high demanding applications. I think this is very important and I thought also Dana uh, enlightened it and, uh, and Kim, that with this extra process, we make it possible that more recyclates in the end can be used or absorbed in the whole plastics chain. That's very important because otherwise we end up with only saturated markets and we can recycle whatever we want, but if there is no application or no takeoff, nothing will happen. Um, and in the end, I think um, um, what we experienced for the last year is that um, we need the EPR organizations to support. I hope that um, a few of them are uh, in this uh, webinar and that they will embrace this QRP process and will stimulate this development to make it in the end possible. Thanks. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, EPR normally gets mentioned a lot earlier, but that's very interesting to, to end on, on that note. And uh, thank you, uh, members of the action team, for giving us some feedback there from being upfront and in practice. I'm going to ask you to stay with us and uh, if, uh, if there are any questions and answers, and also for our panelists to come back. So uh, if I can ask Stephen, uh, Kim, and Dana to come back up. And I believe there's a couple of questions. I'll stop sharing my screen so you can all be seen a little bit uh, clearer. Um, I know that some of the more practical clarifications we can uh, perhaps follow up with and give typed answers to. So uh, one of the earlier ones was about uh, market of injection molding. So Emilia Dalaska, she says, what is the current market of injection molding and the potential to absorb the RPO new? Uh, so I think that's probably one for Kim and Dana. So uh, yeah, I'll, to take that uh, I'll answer from the technical side, at least. So from the terms of properties, uh, there's quite a bit of potential there because the, the current mixed polyolefins we've been playing around with them for years, using also all sorts of additives and compatibilizers or whatever. And in the end, it's very hard to move them beyond the current market of these really robust mm -hmm. products like, like the picnic benches. But with this um, new PO, uh, which, which has a different composition, which has uh, different quality levels, different cleaning levels, we see that properties are actually becoming a lot better. And this key point is really the brittleness. It used to be that these materials are very, very brittle, and we now have much better toughness. So suddenly they are useful for uh, applications like the ones with the, the, the screw thread, where you have pressure being put on the screw, and it needs to be able to flex along instead of breaking. Um, it can go into these larger flexible consumer products. So I think there's, there's a lot of market potential there, and we still need to run a lot of trials, but in terms of technical properties, we can suddenly, I think, go a lot broader, not into everything, obviously, uh, but definitely much, much broader than what we have now. But I'm an academic, I of course have no market numbers, but for that, I'm looking at Dana, uh, who may have some numbers on that. Um, yes, um, and uh, it's really a very good question. It's a question which has been put on the table, on our table, um, at early stages of the project. And the reason for which we had made the choice to partner early on with uh, somebody like uh, Kim and, and her team and uh, get her expertise was exactly because without understanding the potential of these recyclates coming out of the QRP, from a technical standpoint, we would not be able to answer to the question what's the market potential because this market potential depends on what the polymer can give so um, at this point in time i will not give a number because it's too early um, to give a precise number and um, i really don't want to give something which is not correct enough and robust enough i'm going to tell you that 
these polymers being in the hands of certain converters, in addition to uh, in the lab of the university partners, um, we are getting closer and closer to really understand if these polymers can be put in those applications and together with these converters and putting down the numbers. Um, we as CFLEX, we have a parallel project, which is the market research to uh, get the um, granularity of the market size by deep of application in both film and injection molding for both polyethylene and polypropylene. This has been shared in the Packaging Europe webinar, I think like a week ago or two weeks ago by my colleague, uh, Frederick Di Monte. And with him, we're really advancing with fast steps into understanding the market segments at the level of granularity we need to understand. All I can tell you now is that the, the addressable market demand in injection molding for the poly, mixed polyolefin, so PEPP type of injection molding applications, would be at the level of hundreds of thousands of uh, tons for the entire Europe. But I cannot tell you more. Please. Um, uh, wait for us by end of the year, early uh, quarter one next year, we expect to have more precise numbers, again, backed by facts. Great, thank you very much for the developing a little bit more insights on those. I was actually looking for a question for Stephen that I don't recall entirely, but it was something along the lines of uh, uh, PP recycling having a negative economic business case, unless it's uh, a byproduct of significant PE recycling. Um, uh, there was a question mark around some of those areas there. Stephen, would you mind uh, illuminating us? I, yeah, I formulated uh, an answer in, uh, in the chat box also, but in general, it's... Uh... The PP we, we get or we sort from the 323 bill, and so from, from the complicated bill. And the fact that there is more than PP in this bill is just, it's a fact that this is, a, this is the already a pre-sorted bill or a more complicated bill than the 310. So the fact that these other materials are in there, they actually indeed causes a bit more uh, difficult economic balance for, for treating this bill. But still we get this very high quality material out. We get um, the um, yeah, PP out and a PO fraction out. Um, in general, we would say that we try to indeed in the QRP proposes to treat the 310 and the 323 together. Yeah? And then we get these two PP and the PE natural and then the PE flex and the PO. We get all these valuable bales out of there, valuable regranulate that we can make. So indeed they can compensate each other, but also very important to mention here is uh, what is the current destination of these 323 bales? And here we actually recycle parts of it. Furthermore, um, these calculations are excluding gate fees. Yeah? So this can also change the, the economic balance a bit, but of course getting something out of a more complicated bale is indeed uh, more challenging in general to create a net, a good net balance. I don't know if you, Dana, want to add something on that. Sorry, I think you answered quite well. Um, and in fact, what is expected is really that any plant having both uh, 310 and pure flex type of, or starting for the waste, both PMPP would be present in the waste. So obviously um, the, the value created be, would be a combination of the two. And we should not forget uh, the message which we try to pass forward clearly is that the quality recycling process is modular. So you can play with the value created and with the cost based on the end market demand. And when the end market demand would be high, that obviously the prices can uh, be high and um, if, if the market goes to a specific application, then the QRP cost can be managed by managing the type of steps which are to be taken in the recycling. Great, thank you, Stephen and Dana for those. Um, there was a question here uh, directed really about uh, multi-layer flexible packaging and asking what 
initiatives uh, should be taken towards multi-layer flexible packaging in which inks, laminations, adhesives and aluminium coatings have been used for barrier properties. Will it be easy to remove it in mechanical uh, recycling uh, to use again in food packaging? And should we not develop a cost-effective chemical mechanical hybrid recycling for multi-layered flexible packaging? So multi-layers and moving towards a more chemical process. Um, I'm looking at the panel and maybe Kim, uh, Barry, you uh, have some thoughts there? Kim first. I, I, I could. Yeah, I'm reading the, the question on my screen. It's a quite lengthy question. It's a good one. I think when you talk about uh, the necessary evils of, of add-ons like labels and ad adhesives and inks, there's generally two approaches. You can, um, and both of them are designed for circularity approaches. Either you assume that they will stay in, and then you have to evaluate uh, how how bad will their effect be, or maybe will it be a positive effect? So try and evaluate what their impact will be on the recycling stream. Um, there's there's Recyclos protocols for that, for example, who do that case per case, and then you can take it back to the design level. You can also design them for removal. And that's an entirely different thing. And that brings us then to the pre-treatment step. I know that uh, Stephen, for example, is working uh, a lot on delamination, decontamination. So you can add processes again uh, to take these out and yeah. Typically, any of these processes will improve the quality, will also increase uh, the cost. But uh, in the design stage, it's probably very important to realize which way you are going. Are you counting on them to be removed and you have to chemically make them so that they will be easier to be removed? Or are you assuming that they will stay in the process and then you have to make them as yeah, little harmful as possible to the quality and the rest of the recycling? Perfect, thank you very much. Um, Barry. Oh, I, I just want to add, uh, I like that. I think the explanation from Kim was uh, more than enough. Also from my side, uh, I cannot add anything uh, better than this. Good. There are quite a few sort of little smaller clarifications uh, that have been answered as we've been going along. Um, maybe if I come back to some of the demonstrators, um, uh, Maria, Monica, and others, um, a question on the printability of the recycled films and its properties. How have you found working with the, the recycled content? Uh, yes, if I may, I think I, I had comment during my, my intervention, but uh, again, uh, we didn't find any issue with the printability, even we still use uh, two colors in this case. Mm, but we don't expect any issues if we improve a code with uh, seven or eight colors. And the, the printability process was the, the, the standard one with the regular uh, materials. So we are very, very excited with, uh, to, 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 to do the second trial with more largest quantity of material. But uh, even in this case, we did this challenge uh, application like a screen label, the printability was very good. Very good. Um, thank you. I, I, I believe we have some nice little videos as well showing, showing this. So uh, we'll be perhaps sure. um, sharing some of those uh, based on some of these questions here. Um, I'm grouping a few sort of questions or, or, or thoughts. Um, uh, there's uh, what about a, a view to food contact? Uh, so I'm grouping a few few questions together and, and just going to put that out there. Is, is there any perspectives of about uh, food contact applications and results in the future? Perhaps Dana, you might like to take this. Um, yes, this could be a webinar by itself. So I'm going to give a short answer to the question. Um, we, what we aim to do with the quality recycling process is to come with solutions which can be implemented fast. We all in the industry know that if we want to get food contact for anything which is not yet approved will not happen fast. And I'm not gonna elaborate on the reasons because it, it's well known. So what we did in this project did not aim food contact. It does not mean that we're saying that if it's mechanical recycling, it cannot target food contact, but not within short-term implementation, which was the aim of the solution. 
Great. So one very quick last question um, and we'll sign off. Um, is there a similar project for chemical recycling as an alternative parallel to mechanical QRP? And uh, I'm afraid, Dana, perhaps you might be the right person there again. Uh, apologies to the rest of the panel. Uh, I guess that um, given also the, again, the short uh, time, um, it, quality recycling process is something which I hope it, it became clear can modulate the steps in delivering the required quant uh, quality and quantity based on the market demand. We as a, uh, CFLEX had uh, formulated our position on recycling and the complementarity between mechanical and chemical. Um, so what I have to say is that um, as the demand for chemical recycling develops, we can see how chemical recycling can deliver feedstock in, um, can get feedstock um, from a quality recycling type process. But this is a route which is still under exploration very early for us. So it's nothing more I can say now. Uh, but if you are interested in further discussing chemical recycling, feel free to connect with CFLEX. Um, we're interested to listen, to integrate uh, the input and to further work to enable it in the um, practical uh, possible future. Great. Uh, talking about the future, Kim, you maybe had just one quick thing to add on food contact uh, and we'll wrap up. Yeah, I wanted to add something because the, the challenge in the food content is not just can we make the technology of the recycling and the process good enough, it's the income material of the bale. In many approvals for food contact, you need to prove that at least X percentage, and for polyethylene, it tends to go up to 98%, that this amount comes originally from food contact sources. And with the current composition of, of these bales and the current collection systems, that is not the case. And you would need additional processes like the ones that we are able to separate with, with tagging or marking food and non-food uh, contacts. So that's a, a logistic concern, actually, which has nothing to do with the recycling processes itself. That's all I wanted to add. Perfect. Uh, we have uh, covered a lot of ground. I'm hugely grateful to everyone who's participated, to the action team and uh, all your ongoing work. It's good to be able to share a small milestone here. Um, there's a few technical questions. We will try and follow up with those by email uh, or uh, using your registration address afterwards. So I'm going to sign off now by reminding you about what's next. There are a few questions about what kind of partnership model are we looking for, what levels of investment. So there will be a short survey to indicate your interest uh, as we finish, and uh, we'll download the chat and contact with you afterwards. So uh, great to see some uh, interest there already. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, appreciate you being with the webinar today. And with that, I believe we will be signing off and look forward to the next episode.